traditional approach is you had to open the container and expose it to dirty air, and that was the problem. Okay, so if that doesn't make too much sense for you, don't worry, because the takeaway is that it's a lot easier to grow today. And if you never grow mushrooms, now's the time. Because what we can get out of that ability is again a bit unprecedented, I think. And this is where things really, you know, start to make a lot of sense, I think. And this is where the skill set of growing mushrooms, I think in five, 10 years will hopefully become just as common or uh, cu culturally accepted and commonplace, maybe 20 years, depending where you are, as gardening, right? Not everybody gardens, but we know about gardening. You can go to the garden store and buy the things if you want to. And sooner or later, we're gonna get to that point where it's just a common practice because the skills have gotten to that place and, and the practicality of it just is very much there. Okay, so what, what am I saying? Well, there's a lot of things we can do with these, these simple skills. So in the sort of middle there, the white jars, it's basically the, the grain jars I showed a second ago. And if you take my punchline that it's super easy to do those, basically on par with making good uh, homebrew beer, homebrew wine. Not, you know, you can mess it up, you know, and get yeasty, maybe can get contaminated, get moldy. Uh, but a little bit of practice, bumble through it with your friends a couple times, is you can do it while you're making dinner. And really the skills are at that level of complexity. So you make the grains, and you can dry them out, and you can powder them, you can make extractions. This is how a lot of our medicinal mushroom products are made today. I, I'm not sure what the health food store mushroom, medicinal mushroom scene is like in Australia. In the States, a lot of the products are basically powdered up grain mycelium like this, grain spawn as we call it. Eat, you do it on pennies of the dollar at home. Now we can feed that stuff to animals as well. And there's a ton of research, I haven't really said this definitively, but there's a ton of research that the mushrooms are medicinal for us. I mean, I just sort of take that as a granted. Hopefully y'all are on my page. If you wanna split hairs about that, we can do it later. Um, but there's also a ton of research that they're also very good for other animals. Uh, all kinds of wild and domesticated animals in many studies, chickens, you know, pigs, ducks, eels, uh, dogs, cats, etc., horses, have all been shown to benefit from mushrooms and their mycelium in numerous studies. So if you tend any animals ever, even you know, have a house cat, uh, you can look this stuff up. Google Scholar is a great resource. So we can make these products rather than buying them. They're sold in the States. Again, I'm not sure about here, but they're expensive. And why do that? We can grow your own. Um, another really fascinating turn of events from really just the last few years is the notion of growing mycelium rather into things we consume, in, but into things that we make. And, and this is the, the notion that mycelium might revolutionize our, our functional utilitarian world just as plastics did 100 years ago. When plastics were discovered, they revolutionized you know, all types of industries. And we're really on, it seems, the cutting edge of, of fungi doing something sort of similar. Maybe not to the same degree, but perhaps. You know, really, the, the limits have yet to be fully tested. What this means is that we can grow mycelium on almost any urban or agricultural waste. Demolished buildings, um, all kinds of wood. I mean you know, human manure, all kinds of stuff. And we can grow that, that mycelium into whatever shape we want, pretty much, as long as there's airflow and the nutrients are, ba are balanced. Some mycelium is incredibly durable, incredibly tough. Uh, the brick in the lower right is grown on my uh, reishi mycelium on coffee grounds. My friend grew and hit it with a sludge hammer and the hammer just bounces right off it. It's, no, it's not an exaggeration. So we're certainly looking at a future where our, uh, our tables, our functional objects, perhaps even our clothing, or shoes, you know, really, who knows, are to varying degrees, 100% or 50%, made out of mycelium. You know, this is gonna revolutionize the way, the world we live in, and perhaps in 100 years, you know, everything around us, the, the, the homes we live in, will be so fungally based. Um, you know, be, if we jump forward in time, we, we wouldn't understand the world we were in, or we'd be really excited, that's how I'd feel. Um, so there's a great Vice video on this called Fungus the Plastic of the Future. Ten minutes, they really knock it out of the park and hitting that point home. It really does seem to be that. And the beautiful thing is with the cultivation techniques, ten years ago this would have been for, you know, an industry. Nowadays you can do this in your garage. You can make all kinds of, you can make your own table out of my sim if you want to, a little bit of practice. Of course, we can grow just mushrooms. Uh, you can grow them in the desert. You can grow them in a dry environment. You just need to provide humidity. You can do that with machines, but you can do some lower tech uh, options with a little bit more manual labor. Happy to chat that up also at the break. Um, but yeah, we can grow mushrooms in the traditional routes, oysters on straw, shiitake on logs. These are some of the most cornerstone techniques. If you're new to all this, you can someday look it up if you're into it. Um, to even more, to even on the lower left is uh, oysters on newspaper. Cheap, simple waste, easy food. 
But beyond that, what's most fascinating is we can grow mushrooms on all kinds of things beyond, beyond these perhaps less accessible resources. Really, wherever you are, again, the, the best way to cultivate is to work with whatever's locally abundant and hopefully free, and hopefully some sort of waste that can't even be fed to animals because it's, say, too high in tannins or something, like coffee, uh, coffee husks. Uh, all kinds of things. Water hyacinth on the right, the world's fastest growing invasive, um, and grow mushrooms on it. Where I live, there's an invasive plant called scotch broom. Uh, easily grow mushrooms on it. It's in the upper, upper left, um, et cetera. We nowadays can also grow mushrooms in reusable containers and be, of course, much more sustainable. A lot of mushroom cultivation relies on one-time use plastic bags. I lean towards reusable jars, bottles, buckets, and of course, natural outdoor installations. Um, and there's many ways to incorporate fungi into our natural landscapes uh, than I think most people really think about because, again, we don't learn to think about fungi. Um, if this is new to you, this is uh, one diagram of what's called a food forest, sort of a one offshoot of permaculture. Um, but what's going on here is it's mimicking a climax forest with different canopy layers of trees and shrubs and ground cover and buried wood and little ponds catching water. And what I always like to point out is that fungi can be incorporated in this design in many different levels. And that even in drier parts of Australia, if you have sort of these little o oases, you know, you can bring fungi in and probably grow something that will survive. It's more locally tolerant of the conditions. From the ground level to the, to the buried wood to the watery areas, a fungal layer can be added to these what are called food forests, but again, are just not often, I don't think, emphasized enough in the books and in the workshops. One step beyond this, when we start getting outdoors, um, is the, the ability of fungi to clean up the pollution in our environment. And again, this is another one of these huge uh, worlds of possibility that have just hardly begun to be explored. This is what one of the things that really turned me on more deeply into mycology 10 plus years ago. Like I said, I started when I was 15, 16, but it was really coming to understand that fungi, because they're great chemists, as I mentioned, because they're great decomposers, um, I'm sort of summarizing, but with those abilities to break down, we now find that they can break down all kinds of things, from plastics, as I mentioned, to many industrial toxins and pollutants quite easily. Uh, it's been shown numerous times in the lab and even in a handful of instances out in the field, but we just need more people practicing it. And really, anybody can do this, um, but it's just getting to the ability where you can do it well and, and hopefully design a good experiment. And this is what I advocate for to help advance the science more thoroughly. Um, they can also uptake heavy metals. They can pull heavy metals out of polluted river systems. This is perhaps one of their more interesting applications. Um, here, this is a photo from Colorado from a couple years ago when a mine uh, tailing pond basically spilled into a big river and it was quite the scene. And when this happened, what I proposed to, to, to folks in the, I was in the area at the time was putting different fungi in there because certain species, they naturally bind metals, heavy metals to their tissue. It's like a magnet, if you will. So you can just put even dead mycelium in there from the mushroom farm. They don't have any more use for it. Plop it in there, the metals stick to it, pull it out, and you can even recycle that metal, perhaps even make some money doing it, you know, on top of everything else. Um, there's a lot of good research with that, just developing this, making this more uh, precedented, precedented and commonplace is just gonna take time. Um, <clears throat> The one easy example of this is on the Radical Mycology site. This is a uh, video I made a few years ago, just a short time lapse, showing oyster mushrooms that I trained to grow on coffee, uh, excuse me, cigarette filters. Let's see if it'll play. And it's not playing. I think it's going to, yeah, here we go. It's so hot, my like, computer's freaking out. Can I jump for it? Well, I won't play it. Yeah, it's going. So what's going on there is the, the mushroom is slowly growing up on the left into these used cigarette filters. And why is this interesting? Well, cigarettes, as you might know, are the most polluted thing in the world. And the problem with them is that they're like a sponge full of nasty chemicals from the smoking. And when we toss them out, they leach and they fall into the river and eventually end up in the ocean, where they're the most common pollutant in the ocean is a cigarette. If we can figure out streams to, to collect these materials, this, this huge waste, incentivize it, and then clean up the toxins by having the fungus grow through it, you can't really see, but actually in the normal video, there's like a yellow stream that's coming off the, the cigarette on the left. 
Um, we could even perhaps build our tables and functional objects and insulation for our homes out of cigarettes or make some other practical use out of this otherwise you know, complete waste. And this is something anybody can do. Many people I've shown this to, taught this to, set up a little jar in your porch or what have you and smoke it, throw it in there, tell your friends. So a lot of my work has revolved around um, trying to bring this knowledge to folks. Uh, as I mentioned, over 10 years ago, I formed an organization with some friends called Radical Mycology. And our, uh, in various ways, we've just tried to celebrate fungi and to destigmatize them and to point out all these different potentials and actually quite a lot more. Uh, some of the things we've done several years ago, we did a big three-month tour around the states, basically taking this knowledge to folks who otherwise didn't know about it. That was really our goal. Rather than preaching to the choir of the mushroom clubs and other mushroom people, we went to all kinds of uh, food and environmental justice-based organizations, uh, water rights organizations, um, community sustainability projects, community gardens, basically, you know, kind of a, a wide spectrum arts collectives to show that fungi can be incorporated into really any aspect of society and culture. We just need to start talking about this more and saying, yeah, mushrooms are kind of cool. Um, every, every other year or so, there we go, thank you, Taj, Perma Pixie. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Um, yeah, every other year we host the Radical Mycology Convergence. Um, this is from our last one in New York a couple years ago. And basically this is a community-driven effort, volunteer-run, uh, multi-day campout, hangout, cookout, where we are doing hands-on projects to remediate and rejuvenate the land we're being hosted on while teaching a wide variety of workshops and skills and having bonfires and a good time. So there are people that come from overseas, so think about it. Um, and you can go to RadicalMycologyConvergence.com to learn about that. RadicalMycology.com is the other site. Um, and just to show that there's been a lot of ways to, to you know, just some practical pictures of how this can play out. From, these are from our tours. Um, these are some organizations worked at on the, basically they're similar. One's in Olympia, Washington on the west coast of the states. One's in Atlanta, Georgia in the southeast. Um, these are two organizations working with at-risk youth or low-income families to teach them how to farm or rather garden in their sort of depressed neighborhood. And in both instances, we're providing mother mushroom beds, basically large patches of mycelium that will establish and they could take handfuls of, go to the, you know, the, the participant or the client and basically use that as the inoculum to start a new mushroom bed and to teach them how to grow. These are very, very simple skills. Some, some mushrooms, even in Australia, uh, I'll be doing a workshop next week in the area and this is one of the species called the garden giant or kingster fairy it's very heat and drought tolerant one of the best ones to work with really anywhere in the world um, outdoors it's one of their best go-to starter outdoor species um, produces great tasting and really large mushrooms um, yeah and then in just some other instances um, on the left this is from an, another workshop from that tour where we installed two different mushroom beds. Uh, it's kind of hard to see, but there's actually two tiers. And this was to collect pollutant, or sort of wastewater coming off a septic system that was leaking. And so the, my, the water would filter through the my mushroom mycelium. The mycelium was theoretically trapping these pollutants or the pathogenic microbes, reducing their you know, toxicity to, the, to this creek at the bottom of the valley, uh, while also reducing a lot of the, the scent. Very easy to install this, and it, and it definitely helped the issue. Whereas on the right side, this is a, a totally different approach to incorporating fungi. This is on a 30-person community land project in Portland, Oregon, where I live. Um, and this was a four-species mushroom spiral labyrinth garden that we designed to mirror the four, four seasons and four elements. So there's four spiraling um, trenches filled with different species, each reflective of the season, that start at the four corners um, in a pathway that, that follows them. You can walk into the center and sort of take a, a you know, meditative approach. Um, you know, many, many ways that, you know, it's a functional garden. It produced mushrooms you could eat, but that really wasn't the point. It was more of a uh, showing that nowadays we have so many ways to engage with fungi and really once you can grow the mycelium for really almost next to nothing, once you have the infrastructure, why not place them everywhere and anywhere to enhance the beauty of our, our lands and our lives, um, inside or outside? You know, and I mean that on different levels. For me, this has uh, been, I think, really one of the most enjoyable aspects in, in all my work of working with fungi is seeing how many ways 
that they can uh, engage with our lives, how many ways that we can uh, not only apply them, but how we can learn from them to apply them uh, in a way that's most reflective of what they offer. Fungi really, you know, if, if they did come first in the, in the evolution of life, as I sort of suggested, it really puts a whole new perspective on, on where we sit in the scheme of things. Are we at the pinnacle of some sort of triangle of life? I don't think so. You know, if anything, animals and plants are just a subset of the fungal system that really rules the planet, really designs it and has always designed it and will always be here, you know, whatever shall pass. So I think there's a lot of humility that comes from that for me and reminds me that, you know, we're all right in the middle of the web and really what's hidden in that web that we don't see is often the mycelium that's connecting it all together and helping it flow forward. Um, and along with that is, is sort of the, the reminding, the, the remembrance of my place in that. This is one of the things that I always like to mirror and reflect on as well is that uh, at the same time that there's the, the connectedness and the, and the beauty of the mycelial metaphor, there's also the potency and, and the importance of the individual in that network and the, the, the autonomy and also the, the um, integrity that has to come with recognizing each individual's place in that net. In, in, when fungi grow, it's a network, but there's individual tips, and each individual tip really is kind of like an individual human in that greater culture, and each one has its own small influence that real, will ripple back both directions, back into the culture and out into the environment. And it's the same way when we go mushroom hunting, where we see a mushroom in the woods, we pick that one individual, and we might forget that it's actually not an individual, that it is connected to this greater environment doing so many things, but yet our experience with it is just, you know, one-on-one -on -one for just that moment. So uh, a lot of my work has just tried to summarize this in many different ways. Uh, radical mycology is where I started uh, many years ago with friends. Nowadays, uh, I try to teach in various forms. Um, so I'm happy to talk about that. But really my hope is whatever you got out of this talk, because I know it was quite a lot, um, hopefully there was something that maybe hit you the hardest. And, and I encourage you to, to share that at your work with your family around the next, you know, Christmas dinner or, or whatever gathering when you don't see your aunt too often. You know, just say, hey, I learned this thing, but with a straight face. Because I think that's really where uh, discussion of ethnomycology needs to go is really trying to figure out in everybody's different way of stripping away the taboo that surrounded fungi for so long and they're sort of, they're weird, they're gross, da, 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 da. Say, no, they're, they're this massive part of the natural world. They're incredibly fascinating and important, and I love them. <laughs> anyway, so thank you all. Um, <laughs> and I think we have a few minutes um, for... Yeah, I think we have about a little over 10 minutes for a handful of questions. Hi, um, I was just wondering on the efficacy of using mycelium and mushroom beds in greenhouses for heating and um, carbon dioxide production. Have you experienced successful um, results with this? In rocket mass heaters, is that what you're saying? Yeah, well, I, um, just even having like grow beds underneath your tables and them, yeah. Uh, maybe you could rephrase the question. I, I don't think I've experienced doing what you're saying, but I could maybe hypothesize. Yeah, well, that's what I've done in my head and I'm just thinking because I live in an area that's quite frosty and gets snow. And um, I was just thinking in terms of like the thermal mass that's produced um, by growing mushrooms in say like a plastic plastic greenhouse or something that it could produce that heat rather than using a thermal compost. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Well, yeah, no, I, definitely mushrooms do produce a lot of heat um, when they're actively vegetatively growing, kind of what's going on here. They're not producing mushrooms. They're not in the fruiting sexual stage. They're in a vegetative growth stage. And so there is a lot of metabolism and a lot of heat does come off of that. Um, and so, yeah, depending on your space, you could have multiple grow bags or different systems and heat would come off of that, d definitely. Um, would it be enough to warm your house? You'd have to pack a lot. The problem there, though, on the flip side is that, as you're sort of getting at, they're also pumping out a lot of CO2. So you don't want to breathe that, because then it can be, to a certain degree, unhealthy. 
So you want to get a carbon dioxide meter, make sure it's safe. Thank you. Um, I have two questions. One, when's the next um, mushroom convergence? And um, the other was, um, uh, from a natural medicine point of view, uh, I was really interested in that. I'm a recently graduated naturopath, and I, I feel like people that have candida or um, tinea or and that, um, medically are often prescribed antifungal medication, they just keep getting reoccurrences. And I, I wonder if that's because it's disrupting the microbiome, what you were talking about. So the first question is easy. The second one is very hard. The <laughs> um, first one is where we, we've been doing it on the even years. So 2016 and 2018 would be the next. Um, but it's yet to be set in stone if we will do it this year. So we have an email list kind of on all those websites. You can join and uh, keep it ear to the ground. If it's not this year, then it would definitely be next year, but hopefully this year. Um, second one, I, you know, of course I can't say, so I don't want to propose, but I do think, uh, you know, I'm always willing to go out on a limb with some of these things and say, well, what if, this is kind of my life, well, what if, you know, it doesn't hurt to s ask that, and yeah, what if our, we're messing with the microbiome in ways we don't understand, it's causing other health impact, it's sort of what I suggested with, you know, who knows, drinking chlorinated water or these other things we consume, and how does that influence these, these fungi especially, that everywhere else in nature, they're really regulating the health of, of life, and this is, it sounds out there, maybe not to you guys, but um, especially with plants. I mean, with the endophytes, you, you, if they're doing a fraction of what they're doing in plants as endophytes inside of us, there's there's no discussion. I mean, this is critical to us, for us to understand. Now, what to what degree and, and, and all these different ways, this is what we're looking into. This is probably going to be decades of research, and hopefully the research will pick up rather than decrease. Um, there's a really interesting, now I can't say one way or the other, somebody turned, it on, turned me on to it recently. Um, and I can't really comment on it, but check it out if you're an open-minded person, is a documentary called Cancer is a Fungus. And basically, you can check it out. It's this Italian, he was a doctor, and he lost his license, et cetera, et cetera. But he was basically trying to say that <coughs> cancer was caused by fungal imbalance. It was really the point of it. And this was years ago. It was like dec two decades ago, <coughs> totally off the chart. And nobody believed him. Everybody thought he was totally crazy, and so he lost his license. Um, but I think some of the arguments are pretty compelling, especially from my standpoint. The things he say, I mean, you know, especially as a pattern, as far as patterns go, I say, well, I don't know about the human body. I'm not a doctor, you know, in anatomy, anatomy, physiology. But if, as far as fungal functioning goes, biology goes, that that would make sense. What he's saying. So I don't know. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, just one more question, actually. Um, uh, Paul Stamets talks, uh, uh, has apparently said that um, beware of Chinese mushrooms, like mushrooms coming from China. But um, I kind of think, well, w we sell a lot of really amazing mushrooms in where I work, and um, I think they're amazing. So I, and I think they are sourced well. So yeah, customers often ask that about, oh, if it's sourced from China, I'm not sure. What are your thoughts? Well, there's, I mean, I hate to name names or anything, but I guess there'd be, there's definitely two, two, two camps on that, and maybe I won't name names. And the one camp is that Chinese mushrooms are, uh, can be, in, in other countries too, where the, where the environmental regulations aren't, as, aren't the same as they are in other Western countries, or food quality production measurements are different, et cetera that the mushroom is grown on, you know, it can be all kinds of things. It can be grown on some sort of toxic substance and the fungus accumulates toxins. That definitely can happen. And if there's no regulation or no ethical regulation or consideration by the grower, they're just getting whatever they can grow on, then yeah, that could be an issue. I mean, in Washington State, where I used to live, there's also no regulation on how fresh mushrooms came to market. So the guy next door could be growing on some weird waste product and selling at the farmer's market, you know? So is it, it could be anybody without, without high ethics. Um, the, it's also air quality, the stuff can settle on the mushroom, uh, industrial portobellos and things are heavily sprayed with fungicides because they get attacked by molds too, and if you don't wash those raw mushrooms in the salad bar, you know, you're eating that stuff. Um, so yeah, it, it can be across the board. Is it higher degree of that from Asian countries? Perhaps. 
but then it's also where are they grown and what are their standards. There are companies that do get their stuff from China because the cost is so much lower and the, and the tradition, the customs, and the quality is so much higher. Uh, well, the quality is higher because of the tradition. And, um, and they're growing there, you know, they'll show promotional videos. They're high in the mountains, way apart from the chemicals and the smog and all this. China's a huge country. So you're, you know, you're really stereotyping. You say it's all Chinese mushrooms are bad. That's kind of all I can say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, thank you. That was an amazing talk, but I missed half of it. So are you guys, are you doing any more talks in this festival or in Melbourne while you're still? Here oh. and our second question is: uh, uh, I'm from Japan, where the Fukushima radiation um, problem happened, and I had this a uh, team of people that's uh, working on uh, breaking down radiation with um, mushroom, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so I'm only in Melbourne, uh, Australia, Melbourne area for a little over a week now. I'll be doing a workshop through Milkwood Permaculture, but it's sold out next weekend. Um, but yeah, I'd love to come back. And I don't have a sign-up sheet, but if you go to any of those websites, you can sign up for, um, especially go to radicalmycology.com, sign up things right there. If the email it's low traffic, um, and learn about it. Also got, if you want to learn a little bit more, I have, my book does ship from within Australia, so you can order it. There's little cards up here. You can order it, learn some stuff that way. But yeah, I hope to come back next year so yeah, talk to me. Um, for your other bigger question, what I, I think you're getting at is this idea that was put, put out several years ago when Fukushima happened, that theoretically, hypothetically, we could inoculate the polluted environment in the immediate you know, zone of, of Japan, but also on the West Coast US where a lot of stuff swept over with uh, mushrooms, with mushrooms specifically, uh, one called Gymphidius glutinosus, the hideous Gymphidius, that's known to accumulate 10,000 times radioactive cesium, uh, you know, based on background levels. And there's a lot of variables there that you, to try to clean up this pollution. So the notion is you go out to where it's all polluted, sprinkle the mushroom, hopefully it grows, which is a long shot, and then basically for probably centuries, or generations at least, you have to harvest the mushrooms every year because they're slowly sucking up the metals, the to toxic isotopes, but if you just let it sit there, it would rot, and those isotopes would just stay there. They're not changing, they're not going away. The mushroom can't transmute it. Um, it stays, a, a mercury stays mercury, iron can't turn it into gold or whatever. Same idea with these uh, radioactive uh, isotopes. So all the fungus can do is concentrate it. Plants can do this well. A lot of plants also sweep and concentrate metals, but the question is the same there as with mushrooms. What do you do with a heavy metal contaminated plant or mu mushroom? Um, there's no good answer, really. You have to pick it, then put it in a sort of safety zone where it's known that the, con the contaminants are concentrated, like a landfill or something. Not a great option, but what else can you do at this point? Um, heavy metal, which sort of rolls in radioactive isotopes, you know, roll into heavy metal realm. Uh, contaminated soils are sort of the hardest things to, one of the hardest things to remediate. It's so dependent on pH and nutrients and a million other variables. Soils are super complex, and fungi can only do so much and only so quickly. Uh, the best measure is to not ever spill the stuff. Uh, maybe that's obvious. I think we have time for one more question. Anybody else? Um, I was just wondering if you had oh, this is it. Um, any like uh, if you'd heard of research or saw potential for um, strains of fungi to become invasive. Yeah, invasive fungi. Um, well, there's up until just a few years ago, it wasn't so much of a concern, especially say cultivated mushrooms. Um, in North America, we shiitake is not indigenous to North America or South America, the Americas. Um, but we've been growing it on logs and in farms since the 70s, and yet it hasn't leaped from the oak log right in the guy's backyard to the, o the wild oak log or the stump or whatever out you know, over the fence. Why is that? Why haven't the spores traveled and established? It's a, actually an ecologically curious question. Why haven't they sort of become invasive? Um, but, so that hasn't really happened with shiitake, but what has happened in probably less than a decade 
is the yellow oyster has actually started becoming invasive. And this is actually really new uh, research. I went to the Mycological Society of America meeting this last August, I believe it was, or July, I forget. And a friend of mine, she's doing her graduate work researching this topic among others. So the yellow oyster, oyster mushrooms are some of our most easily in, uh, easy to grow, commonly cultivated mushrooms all around the world. And there's different varieties of them. Uh, the yellow is a specific species, but sort of in the same family. And it's a subtropical one, likes warmer temps, super easy to grow. And folks are growing in the Midwest, uh, US, and it was only imported, it's also not native, I think, yeah, less than 10 years ago. And she started seeing them on her, on her walks in Wisconsin, right in the middle of the States, and started posting to Reddit and saying, hey, is anybody else seeing these in the wild? And then boom, photos from all over the Eastern half of the States going back seven years, you know, pretty much just a couple years after being introduced, they started popping up in the wild, really taking over. And that's a major consideration about you know, what are they doing ecologically? We have no idea how they're gonna displace native oysters. Um, so that's a concern with that species. So now I actually don't uh, advocate cultivating it if it's not native to your environment. Um, and then there's another one, the, the death cap. This is one of our deadly mushrooms. It's an Amanita species. And it seems to have come over to California on the roots of European oaks. And now it's starting to establish in the root. It's a mycorrhizal mushroom, so it lives in the soil, and it's starting to displace native amanitas. And it's also considered an invasive soil mushroom. And it's a worrying one because it's one of our few really deadly mushrooms. Um, so it does happen, you know, uh, not, you know, yeah. As far as the <coughs> microfungi and um, some of the other mycorrhizal mushroom fungi that don't produce mushrooms, some of them are found around the world but they'll sort of have their own varietal or off, offshoot. And though they are the same species, technically some places like Hawaii will, won't allow them to be imported just to, to be safe. Okay, great. I think that's all we have time for. I'm sure Peter could keep talking all day. <laughs> Such a wealth of knowledge. Thank you again, Peter, for joining us. He's come all the way from Portland, Oregon to be with us here today. Thank you. Yeah, thanks everybody. And uh, he does have some little leaflets here. Uh, check him out at radicalmycology.com. And like he said, he's got books available uh, that can ship from Australia. So if you're interested in reading more, uh, you can sign up on his website and you can order his book and dive in deeper.